I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 97 of Shunya 1. We got a really really interesting episode in front of us. We have today Sharan Tulsiani from Google Play Store coming up to talk about you know a lot of stuff, a lot of the issues that we might be having with the Google Play Store, the kind of things that are going on. Reaching back to last week, we had Pranav Kasuri on and we asked the question in response to his episode, do you think influencer marketing is effective in the Indian market? Yes or no? Overwhelmingly, people believe that it is influential. I agree with that. I think that influencer marketing works. It works in certain contexts. You've got to be careful about what that is. And uh, yeah, I think that it is an important way that people are going to be reaching out to people going in the future. And with that, let's get on with the show. All right, welcome to the show. I'm here with Sharan Tulsiani, who is my guest for the day. How are you doing, Sharan? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. I had a lovely cab ride here, and yes. so that was that was fun. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, it's been great. This is my first time in a setup like this, and it is much cooler than a much more complex than I thought it would be. Oh, really? Yeah. So thank you yeah. for inviting me here. Yes, this is it's cool. Good, it's good to have you. Uh, in spite of the horrendous cab ride you had on a lovely Mumbai weekend, that we are here today. <laughs> but but given that you've been here for a while, of course, uh, mm-hmm. you, why don't you tell us a little bit of your background of uh, how you got into the role you are doing today? And of course, uh, we're going to talk a bit about that. But tell us a, tell us a little bit about your prior journey to this. I tell you what. First, you tell me how long do we know each other. I'm going to take a guess. It feels like it's for a very, 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 very yes. long time. And I can't put my head, I can't put, my, put a finger on it. I'm going to take a guess at least uh, 10 years, 12 when years. When did we meet first? I, now I'm, I can't I think we have remember. common friends. Yeah. We had common friends uh, way, way back. And, Is it college? Was uh, it? Yeah, during college. In yes. college? Yes. I think we had a lot of common friends. Yeah. You remember Nandan? Yeah. So you, and all was that. it Yamini? Was that, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, there we yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and then, Nandan, guys, shout out to you. Yeah, shout out, guys. <laughs> I know we haven't caught up in the Dude, longest. That's uh, just, and they're all in cool places. And they're now. all in cool places. That's been sixteen years, roughly. Yes, Six, fifteen to sixteen years, and this is the first time we've actually probably spent more than five minutes with, with each other. That's true. Wow. That's okay. True. So good. So then you you you've been there at the start of this journey, then. Yes. Uh, if if you know to put that in context, but how did I get here? Uh, I often hesitate to talk about my own journey simply because like most uh, of us it's, it starts out very unplanned yeah it, like, it, i guess that, that's yeah. exactly how it started for me as well i mean i jumped into my first entrepreneurial role so how did it start for you and how yeah. did you do all the cool things that you've been doing since no i hesitate because it's not a great example like Doesn't it's matter. not something you want to tell people like oh do this because it is quite a crap shoot in the sense that i think there's so much luck involved mm-hmm. right and looking back, and I love to, you know, when meeting people, make this a very cool story because it sounds cool. You mm-hmm. know, we're, now we're in 2019. We're talking about the video game industry. You know, mm. to say that I've been in the gaming industry for 17 years sounds like oh shit, this is this is this awesome. guy knows this guy knows he's, his stuff. He's been doing some cool stuff for a very long time, and I and I think I have. But I think that was it. it was a pursuit of stuff that I really really enjoyed from day one, and you know, I was lucky enough to. Like like most good tech stories and techie stories start is a parent or somebody bought you a computer. That's mm-hmm. where it starts. Right? Oh yeah. yes, I know mine. Did. You know, Similarly, you know, yeah. the year was nineteen ninety five or something, something like that. And uh, the computer, I opened the computer and boom, went on this magical journey that I'm still on, sort of thing. But essentially, I love tinkering with stuff. I love building, breaking things, and and I was just stubborn. The fact that I did, I refused to listen and. What it was was a sort of sheer joy of of figuring out how to do things differently. So I started with, <clears throat> I started fairly early around the time that we met, uh, perhaps, which was, you know, actually maybe before that, which was just maybe in the first year of college or the last year of junior college, mm-hmm. where I was really into computers. I was sort of opening and, and, and assembling and fixing other people's stuff. And I was a terrible student, right? It was one of those weird very standard Indian stories where you you know you look at a computer you're fixing it you're on the computer all day and you you tell your parents I'm on the com- doing computer things quote unquote and they're like ah beta engineer banega huh. you know <laughs> smart kid he knows so much you ask him a question he yeah. can answer it like yeah. wow yeah of course being on the internet early gives you a perspective and, and yeah. I was lucky enough to have that but 
I was and I still am a terrible student. Like absolutely no yeah, yeah. interest in 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 I, school. I, this is exactly the story I've uh, <laughs> matching so far. So okay, please great. proceed. Great. So, but I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Like everybody is a business person, you know, uh, men and women. So if you look at my, my father's side of the family, everybody's a business person. Sisters, mm-hmm. chachis, chachas, uncles, you know, they're all wow. business people. So wow. I have cousins who even today work in 10 days a month and, and make twice as what I make, even even now. Wow. And they look at me and they're just like, haha, so where are you? They're like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm working. They're like, yeah, we're in Macau this week <laughs> for a break again, <laughs> seven times this year. Uh, but anyway, so that's a kind of uh, very... Um, confident <laughs> that family that I come from in, in that right. sense. That's right. Very confident. And anyway, so I started this computer shop at the age of 16 or 17 um, in Lokanwala. It was called Computers Etc. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have my... Okay, I keep saying lucky because I, keep, I believe that or maybe, uh, maybe it was something more. But, um, you know, my dad wanted to spend some time doing something else. He had retired from his old business. And so we, we ran this computer shop and... Um, as a 16, 17 year old, you don't understand the idea of ownership. You kind of pick up to it slowly. You start selling. Um, you start convincing people. Oh, look, this is tech. People hadn't seen computers back then. People would come into the store and they'd never seen, you know, what we take for granted. Just screen light up and, and a graphical user interface is so cool. Um, and then the ability to go on the internet or, or play a game. And it, I think what really set me off on this path was the, we would spend a lot of time in the nights, me and I had these uh, two or three technicians, or mm-hmm. engineers, quote unquote, as we call them, but really, you know, technicians, who were boys from like smaller towns, you know, their parents had probably saved up a lot of money and sent uh, and sent them to these technical training schools, right? So they had uh, possible English skills, maybe not that, but mm-hmm. parents really invested hoping that the IT boom is happening, our kids will have a better life. So these three, four boys and me, We'd be sitting in the store in the evenings, you know, assembling computers and we would do stuff like, can you, who can assemble things the fastest? Everything became a game, mm-hmm. which is, you know, what you do at that age. And eventually got to the idea of you get more and more competitive and it was like, okay, you know, let's do one thing. Shutter band mm-hmm. It's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, you close the shutter uh, of this physical, the store. And then we'd sit and we'd set up the computers on a LAN and then I'd teach them how to play games. And these guys had only used computers for work. Right. It was something they did as a job and then they'd go home and the idea of affording something like that was, was many years ahead for them. And so then I would show them games. I got to not, not just show them, you know, how to use the internet and things on computers, but also what is Counter-Strike? What is, yeah. you know, yeah. what, what are all these things? And boom, that's where it hit me. That's what hit me, really, was not just gaming, but making other people play, mm-hmm. you know, when somebody's eyes go like, oh my God, like I shot you or I played like this or I did this and I thought of a different way to do it and then it succeeded and then I beat you. And that, that, that feeling was, was sort of, you know, uh, once, once you get a taste of that, it's hard to switch off. And then that became sort of my personal journey, which was not perhaps writing games or creating games where most people start, right. but it was enabling them. Enabling people to play. The high for me was getting people to play games, right? So when I was graduating from 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 college, uh, many years later, I had to shut down the business because I couldn't study and run the business together. But uh, I was graduating from college, and uh, I, you know, I was a finance student, mm-hmm. right? My mm-hmm. BMS in finance, mm-hmm. just you know, like like a good good boy shit you know yeah. I, I, engineering though was too far for me I, I didn't have the rigor to the math no way in hell but this is this is the yeah PMS was I think it was first or second year of BMS third year for so, me yeah, I think, yeah. you, think you guys if you were in the same circle you yeah. guys the year earlier I, I lost a year because I tried to do BSCIT ah. total cluster by yeah. the Mumbai University yeah. but yeah so when when I uh, was about to graduate I had a job lined up like this was like college and placements and you know uh, the professor had a bunch of, some of these firms were hiring very low level finance positions and it, was, it made sense. I'd enter it, work for a couple of years, become an analyst or or do a CFA or, you know, do an MBA and something like that and mm-hmm. go down that path. And I get this call from this gaming company, 
right? I tried, a friend of mine who is an animator calls me and says, you know, there's a gaming company in India. It's a Filipino company doing something in India. It's an online game, MMORPG. Do you want to try it out? I have some access codes or something. So it's like, okay, awesome. MMORPG. If you don't, yeah. if for those who don't know it, that's massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It's very, very... It's a super popular genre. Super popular, especially back in the day, back, you yeah. know, like eight, nine years ago, before mobile, the mobile revolution sort of took over everybody's lives. We, we and we played, I, I played the game, I didn't like it. And a few months later, I get called for like, a, oh, you know, focus group kind of thing. And I go in and I show up at this, this office, and this is where luck comes in, right? I show up at the office, it's, um, I've got my job, uh, my final exams are a month away. All I need to do is just show up, give my exams, graduate and start working. And for some reason, I said, I'll go there and, you know, it's near my house. I show up, I'm sitting in the office and the, the guy who calls me to do the market research or whatever, he wants my feedback uh, because I didn't like the game, uh, doesn't show up. And I'm sitting there and I'm getting annoyed. I'm like a, you know, very cocky, whatever, 20 year old. And in this cool gaming office, the first and the, the first I'd seen and definitely the coolest in the country that I'd seen that, that existed back then. And this dude walks past and I was like, I'm talking to the receptionist. I'm like, hey, you know, what's going on? And been there for two hours. And then I turned around saying, hey, you know, listen, if you're going in, can you check if this guy's there? I don't know who you are, sir. I'm so sorry for disturbing you, but can you get this for me? And he asked somebody about this. And he's like, oh, you know what? I'm so sorry. Let me take care of this. Let me take you inside. And we start chatting and he loves what I have to say about the game and how it can be different. Turns out, of course, he's the CEO of the company. And, uh, <laughs> That's a good and one. then he's like, it becomes a three and a half hour session. And he calls in the marketing guy, he calls then the guy who interviews, who was actually called me, comes, shows up two hours later, even then. And uh, yeah, and then I walk out and as I'm at the lift, he, he walks me out. The CEO is nice enough to walk me out. And he was like, hey, so um, do you want to work here? And I was like, uh, yes. And I'm just like, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, don't say yes, don't say yes, because you have a stable job, your parents will kill you, don't do that. And you can like hear that and drowned out by, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's when I started, man. That's how I started in the gaming industry. And after that, no matter whatever I've done, I worked in advertising. I worked in uh, ad tech. I worked in analytics, ad tech plus analytics company. Somehow, somehow, I worked at Microsoft. I was a what do you call a external vendor role, but you know, I worked in in mm -hmm. the, the Microsoft team. And I, with each of these jobs, it became gaming centric. It was either hired for my gaming expertise or I move the business often towards gaming because that's just how what it draws you. It just yeah. draws me, just what wakes yeah. me up in the morning. Nice. What company was this? I have to know. This was a company called Level Up Games. Mm -hmm. There was a game called Ragnarok Online mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, developed by a Korean uh, developer and uh, published by this Filipino company. Wow. And they set up an office. They were brave enough to set up an office in India in 2004. Wow. 2003, 2004. And unfortunately, they lost a lot of money yeah. And another gaming company after that, which I did, was Creda Games, uh, yeah. which had a game called Dance Mela, which is the first time I entered a studio because I did the voiceover. Oh. <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it was an online game and hilarious because we tried such crazy formats. It was an online dance dance, like a DDR game. If you know what DDR is. Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Dance Dance Revolution. Online yeah. DDR. So you had like a pad, like you put on the floor and you plugged into your computer. And then you would dance to Bollywood music. Oh, it's like you really had to dance. You really had to dance. And then we went and we got like rights for, for we were T series and these places and got rights to put the the music in the game. Oh man. And there was a channel that was launching called Nuts that called NDTV and there was a show called Nachle with Saroj Khan. And my my first deal that I did, which was like we would import Saroj Khan's Avatar in the game because she was teaching people how to dance. Wow. And we came up with this weird idea. It was me, it was my, my colleague. And we got half that in the game and we did stuff cross promotion on the show. Wow. It was cutting edge for 2006. You know. Yeah. Unfortunately, the numbers never worked. India just didn't have enough PC gamers, mm -hmm. you know, home PCs and PC gamers and fast enough internet connections and stuff like that. But funnily enough, a lot of the people that I met back in the gaming days are still really close friends. We were a group of idiots across India who were just sort of united in our love for this. And uh, if you, a lot of them today I meet are incredibly successful doing different things in the tech or gaming space. So it's nice. Nice. Wow. Yeah. And you're talking about a time which is like 
more than 10 years ago uh, in your professional life uh, through the journey there to now uh, and in your role currently uh, at Google of course mm-hmm. you've also had like you've been a part of a few iconic of sorts uh, <laughs> companies who have where you've seen this firsthand what you're exactly talking about the evolution of gaming in the country mm-hmm. uh, tell us about that tell us the fast forward view from what you this realization that pc gamers are not a big enough audience in india in 2006 mm-hmm. to the mobile gaming revolution of sorts that is happening uh, or is it happening i mean i think i see it happening it's it's nuts people play games everywhere all the time uh, on their phones so what is what is going on really you know it it's so tempting to give the standard answer and i don't blame every, anybody for 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 believing the standard narrative which i have been questioning for a very long time because i've been sort of part because of it's close to exactly basis. yeah and i feel like almost at some point i felt like i was crazy like it's like oh it's going to happen this was lining up and people like no that's not how you know india thinks indians don't like this sort of i hate when conversations start like indians don't like paying for things or indians don't like gaming or culturally no we are the most common argument i've heard in the last consistently the last 15 years is culturally because we don't our parents don't encourage us to game or you know game entered it's considered bad we're forced to study we will never play games culturally and it's just a, it's just a lazy It's, it's a lazy it's a cognitive reasoning. bias. It's like it's it's just they, people can't get their head around it. No, because it's lazy. Because a, you have a bunch of in and the most of the people, almost everybody I spoke to, in, who who drove these narratives were essentially management consultants at one point of time, hired by <laughs> hired by firms that you know either startups that I was working with or or you know guys on one side of the VC conversation or or something like that, and they were all trying to justify. why they were failing to drive gaming in the country and and they would eventually say hey you know what we don't have a solution so let's blame the fact that mm-hmm. let's blame something that's as vague as 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 sort of uh, what's the word anyways uh, as as culture mm-hmm. which can't be caught can't be thought let's blame culture okay so where we are at today is we are where we should be mm-hmm. we are where we should be because we got as a, as a country we got these devices mobile phones in the hands of of millions across the and this is very important is it's actually a socio economic story it's not a tech story but we got this we got the technology in the hands of people across the socio economic spectrum and what we saw was what we expected to see which we see in everywhere else in the world which is people like being entertained human beings like being entertained yeah right the only difference is how hard how, how much friction do you put in the experience how hard is it to 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 get to that point and now it's incredibly easy yeah so you give a mobile phone to um an 18 year old in in a in a city and you'll get one set of behavior because because of their exposure their experience and where the expectations are they will pick up their phones and and use them differently and they will mm-hmm. they will move to a different place in 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 entertainment very rapidly right because they've been hearing about it. they 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 have a very clear expectation of what I should get from a phone i you know streaming content needs to be quick and needs to be instant i need to play i need to You know, I need to kick. Also, I'm 18, full of uh, hormones. I need to do. You know, I need a different type of gratification. You give it, but you get the phone to a, you know, a 45 year old person from a small town. In the beginning, nothing will happen, mm-hmm. right? In the beginning, they're taking their phone because, let's say, you're a, you know, your 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 kid is studying in a college somewhere else. Mm-hmm. You're in indoor. I don't know whatever, mm-hmm. right? Say tier two city, maybe even tier three. Definitely tier three. Also, and you know your kid is in another town, so you got a mobile phone because it's practical. It's yeah. not. It's a communication. You device. don't need it in your life. You yeah. you built a fairly stable, sensible life without the need for instant communication. But now that you're getting older, you know people have convinced you that you need to have the device, and now you have it. And then you buy a new one, and then your daughter or son buys you a new one. You buy a new one, a third one. And by the time you get a third one, uh, when you get a first one, you mock. instant communication mm. because you don't see the value in it and that's where most of the country was till recently then of course you get used to it like any log any anything that has inherent mm-hmm. sort of value in it mm-hmm. once you're exposed to it you see the advantages and changes your life because it is in- inherently advantages to be able to communicate instantly and you move to sms and then you move to we you know, get data data comes in we know the geo story yeah. but this was always happening even before geo but you know geo kind of accelerate the process it, yeah. the catalyst was going to happen regardless right 
it's a gigantic boulder standing off a cliff. You just needed it. Whether somebody came and kicked it over, a feather pushed it over, it would happen eventually. Right. And once, you do, once you're on stage two or stage three of this sort of process, you start using communication tools and you're communicating with people. And what happens after you start communicating with people? You start, in, you, you move your engagement higher. Mm-hmm. What's yeah. the next stage? It's, it's, it's doing something where now we're a community yeah. that's connected digitally. Now your form of communicating evolves to a form of community. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, WhatsApp groups are yeah. a big part of it. Facebook uh, it in itself is designed around that. Things like yeah. that. And that's why gaming fits in beautifully because that's what you do. What do you do with, what do people do with people? Yeah. We they, share, we compare, we compete, chill out. we entertain, yeah. we chill yeah. out. Yeah. Very important. Right? And we even try to, most importantly, we go for common experiences that we can discuss later. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, events, movies. Events, movies, anything, yeah. any entertainment form. Any group activity. Any group activity, any sports. entertainment form. Yeah. Sports. And that's what I'm coming to. Sports is, you know, we think of sports as a competitive uh, part of our lives, but it's actually just a framework for a shared experience, which yeah. happens to be competitive. Yeah. Right? I watch a competitive sport. I'm not playing the sport. I suck at cricket. Well, actually, I don't watch cricket either. But, you know, if it's a sport that's competitive, yeah. you could be terrible at it. You could have never played it. But you love watching it because there's drama. There's a story. There's history. There's history is very important in a, yeah. in a competitive sport. Right? Yeah. You support a team for a generation. Your father supported it. You will support it. God damn it. Yeah. And that's, it's not that different for gaming. I don't mean it's exactly the same framework. What I mean is it's a shared experience. Yeah. And so now, as users have evolved, we're going the logical route, which is we're going to pick up more and more of the shared experience, which is why a lot of numbers that you read today are something like 300 million gamers in India, yeah. right, mobile. Wow. Yeah. And I can't officially comment on those numbers, though I've shared officially 250 million, mm-hmm. right? That was, that's like old, older set. We did something with KPMG a while back. I mean, Google did something in KPMG. I wasn't there. Uh, I suspect it would be higher. Yeah. And that's true. What, what a gamer is, is open to, de- to, to uh, interpretation. But what's, what's interesting about the story is that the reason I, I love discussing why people got it wrong. And people got it wrong because they forgot that India is like 35 different countries mm-hmm. that, is, that are spread out, right? 35 different verticals, mm-hmm. you know, area people are different languages. So they're completely vertically sort of different mm-hmm. culturally. But then even socioeconomically, you splice it in many different ways. And what was happening was the conversation on tech and growth and the tech space and gaming was at the peak of the tech space, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. Coding was something that could be, you know, it was something that you could learn by rote. And so the IT industry grew in one, one way and people came from like villages and small towns, went to IT and then went to the US or whatever to work, mm-hmm. right? Gaming, on the other hand, was entertainment, was escape. It's something you pick up only once you have a little time. Free time. Free yeah. time because it was yeah. difficult to access. The friction was too high. Yeah. Now that the friction has been reduced... You're, and you're getting free time. Your free time can be, you don't need a computer to sit on it. You can be, you know, if you're, wherever you are. You're a rickshaw I mean, driver yeah, between, yeah. Uh, very, one something you see very commonly is rickshaw drivers playing. Yeah. I, the amount of rickshaw drivers in playing Candy Crush is not funny. <laughs> in Bangalore, I think one of the things I could have, a, I couldn't communicate with, I didn't speak Kannada, but rickshaw drivers playing Candy Crush is like my uh, go to uh, visual in my head. Um, <laughs> I do But I you see, you see, believe you see, it. Okay, that's the thing. Now look at us laughing, right? Yeah. How, what's, your, what's your tolerance for a bad language? It'll be Perfect. a view. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How big... We're, 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 we're insanely large assholes. That's what yeah. we are. You know why? Because what we forgot in this entire story was actually f- framing who we are in context to India. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're, we think we're middle class. Mm. That is the biggest lie of it all. We're not. Mm-hmm. Right? We're rich. Mm. And here's what the thing was. The gaming conversation, even the tech conversation in general, was run by a bunch of rich people looking at other bunch of rich people, slightly richer, less poorer. Mm. Their frame of reference was just one country, primarily, which was the US. Yeah. Right? And they look at that frame of reference saying, oh, you know, two cars, a house, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm middle class. Mm. Right? Not understanding that, you know, the guy who's driving a BMW is not just rich in India. He's paying 120% tax. So he's twice as rich or... And then he's doing it without credit. So he probably paid cash yeah. for that 40, 50 lakh car. So yeah. a car that costs 25 lakh in the States, you're paying 50 lakh here. That guy's got it on a plan where he pays no like more than $1,000 a month. Like a life lease or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, and this guy went and plopped a bunch of cash at the dealership and picked it up. That is the wealth that we have here, which is insane. 
Yeah. And so it's the top 50 million people or 50 to 80 million people, right? The top 8% of India that has been driving consumption so far and driving the story so far, right? And that includes gaming. So when we looked at the numbers in India, we're like, oh, we're not seeing spread, we're not seeing growth. It's only going to be, we always assume it's going to be restricted to these people. And these people have too many entertainment options. Mm-hmm. But gaming didn't grow for the longest time. But now that you've spread it out, right, to a new audience across the, across the country, across the socioeconomic sort of divide, and the mobile phones are cheap. Yeah. Uh, and powerful. Powerful alternative yeah. to television or basically in larger technological investments yeah. or larger infrastructures like cinema halls and malls Correct. and all of that. It's, it's fit right in the place that it should have, logically. Right? It's just that it didn't happen for so long that people thought was, the reason was cultural rather than looking in, within themselves and saying, you know what, we don't represent the country. Mm. So until the tech actually gets to the people, how can we expect them to yeah. embrace the, this form of entertainment? They just couldn't, even if they wanted to. Yeah. So yeah, that's where we are. And we're, we're, at, we're still not at peak growth, I think, India as a country. Uh, yeah. and if, if, and this was very dependent on how the country grows economically, whether they manage to you know, bring back, I don't know, manufacturing or whatever that they need to to kind of rise the, the actual middle class upwards. Mm-hmm. That depends on Lots of wow. things. So gaming and sort of tax policies are not that far apart. It's a lot that goes into sort of why India is that, growing gaming. That, that, yeah. That's a whole different conversation. It's a whole different conversation. <laughs> yeah. But, but what's cool is yeah. a lot of people are playing games. Yeah. Right? You can go to like a, a shop a, a shop assistant in indoor and say the word PUBG and he'll know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right? Or a sari seller in, in like in in a smaller town and you say Ludo and he knows what you're talking about. Yeah. And three years ago they didn't. Yeah, it's like 200 million people who didn't know these words. You've you've introduced a new lexicon. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. so exciting, man! And to finally see it happen. To finally see it, but look at the scale. We talk about hundreds of millions of people who you, if you went, I don't know where. Are you from Bombay? Yeah, born, brought up. Yeah, like me. Yeah, right. Uh, if you went to a small town, I had, and I've tried this once. I actually don't have common experiences to share with them. Yeah, we because don't, we don't. We don't. We're we living live in city people. We're city, not just city urban people. city. We're yeah. city people in a country where the urban rural divide is massive. Yeah, right. It's not like again the United States where oh you're, you live in a town, you live in the suburbs, and uh, it's you know yeah. quality of life is you know ten twenty percent up and down. This is like you know like hundreds of percentage of points uh, yeah. apart. So and suddenly we have a common experience. How yeah. cool is that? Yeah, that's true. besides Bollywood. Besides, besides Bollywood cricket, right. It's like game. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting though. I mean, and it's become one of the primary, like you said, uh, common moralities that we all share as a country uh, from suddenly these two, Bollywood, cricket. I think there was a strong ABCD, ABCD the <laughs> common, uh, yeah, the yeah. relevance of that. But coming to what you're, what you're seeing now that this has happened, this mm-hmm. is catalyst uh, it's already started the mm-hmm. snowball has started mm-hmm. what do you see as a the people who are players in this uh, or rather in driving this ecosystem like folks like yourselves like folks like the the platform players like google mm-hmm. the the game developers uh, who are actually making games the creative talents behind it do you see that community also sort of quickly from going from the old the the you know the the Desperation that you had ten years ago of like right. of a few people who bonded over this shared like sort of belief to is the corporate power and the the capitalist behemoth behind all of this now like is is it all organized do people want do young kids want to have jobs in gaming do people you know want to support this ecosystem and is it a viable career today maybe talk about that a bit sure yes and and no i mean but i think yes in the sense that the momentum is undeniable and people can feel it mm-hmm. i think everybody's sensing it it's in the air it's a smell it's a shimmer quality of the air you know, photographers talk about it. it's like mm-hmm. that and i think people who have even had their head in their sand even in the industry people who are so used to doing things the way they've been doing it for survival reasons the last 10 years mm-hmm. are are slowly waking up to it now whether they want to drastically change so, you know, how they've been working to mm-hmm. kind of capture or, or, or take advantage of this is one thing, or we'll have completely new players come in and disrupt the status quo, which is, I think it's going to be a good mix. And yes, I think I, think I see a lot of young people trying to, who, who are keen about gaming, definitely, a lot more than they were earlier. 
I'd say we're sort of the adolescence, you know, we're, we're entering the teenage years mm-hmm. where growth spurts are happening and people are kind of figuring out who they are. As a gaming company, do you design for India? Do you design internationally? What level, what kind of quality are you, are you, are you playing with? Um, how much do you invest? Where do you get the money from? Investors are, are figuring it out themselves. They've, you know, jumped, a lot of them jumped in too early, got burnt and are concerned that this is, if this is another bubble. And I, you know, I, I personally talk to them and I tell them that, no, it's not. Here are the numbers. This is what it looks like. You know, these are real numbers. numbers. Yeah. These are sustained, solid numbers. This is what we're seeing. And that's where the cultural conversation always comes. Oh, you know, but will the Indians do this? And I was like, dude, you tell me India, who is India? What is India? You know, define India for me. Define one yeah. one strip of that that segment. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. What 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 people need to understand that people are trying to grapple with, I think, development studios and corporates is that if we're going to do this, and as you start doing this, who do we go after? And I think that's where I've seen the biggest change. I think two years ago it was we're going to make games for India, and 2019, and I'm talking about 2019. It's changed so much in 2018, 19 also. The conversation conversation has become who do we go after in India rather than going after India? Like this is a geographical landmass. And from this audience, how do we splice the market and find our audience and go after them? Because what, what's exciting is that if you're, if you're an investor, if you're a large company and you're looking to maybe acquire or invest in a smaller company or you're already an existing gaming studio or you're getting started, no matter where you are on the spectrum, you know that you could find a niche <laughs> put the, to put that word very carefully because a niche could be 50 million people mm, yeah. which is the population of I don't know France something like that yeah. right so you could find a niche that is big enough for you to sustain not just you but 20 other companies or 50 other companies for the next 10 years yeah. right and that is what people are now thinking about and and a lot of industries sort of come together the, you know you have the ad tech industry which are on the advertising industry which started splicing the uh, the country in terms of interests and you know things mm-hmm. like that and then you have um, studios that have tried different content, local, you know, different language and things like that, different cultural content. So there's a lot of learnings that are coming together right now. Um, what we're doing and, you know, is sort of a fortuitous, perfect time sort of that I, not, what is the word? Forget that. Maybe we can edit that out. But um, the, um, the time that I joined Google about a year ago, and it was a, very interesting time because, you know, great ideas sort of coalesce at the same time. And a colleague uh, in Singapore who's, who's also very keen on doing something with independent, you know, indie game studios, a small, relatively smaller studios. Mm-hmm. And last year, uh, we launched the Indie Games Accelerator in Singapore, which is like this really intense five-day wow. boot camp yeah. where we picked uh, a bunch of gaming studios from across India and Southeast Asia. Um and we we brought them to Singapore. We gave them like five days of of the best men, like an insane level of mentoring. Wow! Like we had guys like you know Mark Skaggs and Rami Ismail, and these are like the the granddaddies, the big the big guys of the gaming industry. Skag Mark Skaggs is the guy who made Farmville. Ah, oh, okay. you know things like that. Wow! Yeah. The, so people like that were, were there. Um, you know, Shanil Dio, the CEO of the company that made Fruit Ninja and Jetpack Joyride, they came yeah. and they gave us five days to chill with 30 gaming studios for five whole days, like eight in the morning was like you show up at eight in the morning, you end at six and then you work even after that. Yeah. And you take all those lessons and then you go and build better games. And we had a bunch of studios from India that we took. This year, we've just announced the, you know, the second class, the class of 2019 for IGA. We've expanded it globally. But, you know, a couple of Indian, three, I think three or four Indian studios, studios have made it. Nice. So that's fantastic. So th- that shows you. And, and these are all incredibly high quality, small studios. So things have changed. They started thinking differently. Yeah. Um, so there are people in the, I mean, we're doing, at least we're doing a lot of stuff in the ecosystem. When I say we I mean Google, uh, Google Play and Google is doing a lot of cool stuff across the ecosystem. Um, and that's essentially built from recognizing that there is a gap yeah. in the the skill set that Indian studios have. And the reason they're not developed, it's like a muscle, right? If you need to develop a muscle, you, you develop it. Indian studios have not needed to build a certain level of quality of games because the market didn't demand it. And they right. were looking at India, looking at what they knew. And they were they were working off a lot of instinct and, and feeling, mm-hmm. right? Which thought, hey, this is a great piece of content. If I build it, 
maybe people in India would play it and then they realized nobody played it because they didn't understand that people didn't have access. So they, it was difficult to comprehend that people didn't have access to devices so they couldn't right. play it. They wanted to play the rickshaw wala. Like, like there are a couple of games I've seen like five or six games that are built around rickshaw, rickshaw rides. Oh, really? Right? At least five or six. Yeah. Just last two years. Oh, wow. Last year. There was uh-huh. probably like 50. But, <laughs> you know, in two years, you will have people who are riding rickshaws who have had or who have friends who ride rickshaws or, or, as for a living uh, who will be playing those games because right. that's, a, that's a story that relates to them. It's right. just not got there yet and now it's getting there. So, as, quali- as, as the market requirements ramp up, studios are ramping up and we're trying to do as much as we can to enable that mm-hmm. uh, from a mentoring perspective, from, a, you know, uh, I spend a lot of time, so I spend a lot of my, lot of my time talking to small studios and trying to just bring whatever learnings I have to them over the last, you know, things I've picked up the last 17 years. Right. So, and there's, there's a lot more stuff that I, I perhaps can't immediately get into. Sure. Yeah. In fact, I have a point which, uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, bring up the concept of what people have been doing or what kind of uh, games have been being made. Mm-hmm. While this whole thing has been going on, one of the early, one of the early apparent successes which we have been seeing in this in the domain is actually something which again goes in the face of will Indians pay uh, is a lot of the semi real money gaming sort of situation well I know it's a very tangential take on pure gaming it's not I think it's it's a it's a whole different uh, kind of business to be in Mm -hmm. but do you think do you see a lot of people sort of taking that as a route to uh I don't know, figuring this out? Or is it just an easy way to sort of attract people by throwing money at the problem? So, if you're talking about semi-real money gaming, which basically means that perhaps they... People I'm not talking about the... To, yeah, not talking about the proper... Pay to play, like, but they, don't get, they don't get a paid output. They don't, they don't make yeah. money from it. They just... Yeah. They I'm not talking about like the skill whatever. gambling yeah, or skill gambling. gaming. I'm talking about like Teen Patti yeah. games, you know, Zynga, Moonfrog, all these guys, right? Yeah. Um, poker stuff like that. Yeah, that's uh, also huge, by the way. That's also yeah, it's, a huge it's doing genre well. because it's doing well. I think that they have an audience, it's look, a skilled audience. Look at from a, look from a gaming perspective, right? From an industry perspective, there is a game, you know, card games, right. which has like a, a thousand plus year history, right? The game mechanics of which are have been refined over hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a game that's that we know people like to play. Right, and it's easy to execute, and then there's a lot of other mechanics that they build in. So I think that there are a few people who did it well. There are fifty times more people who didn't do it well. Mm-hmm. Right, and I think that's 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 a story. I think these are can, can you make you can make you can find different areas that games work at. Right, uh, this was an easy recognizable one that did well, and uh, those studios also realized that. that they have to try different things. A lot of them are trying different types of games. Um, you know, Moonfrog has their their Teen Patti games, but they also have Baubali, mm. right? And Alia Bhatt. And like, mm. those are the kind of things they're experimenting with. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, people should make, and this is really important, build what you what you like to build. Build mm. what, what you're passionate about and what your audience cares about. Like I said, splice your audience, find the audience, build something they care about. Um, but I think most people at the end of the day, human, human beings inherently care about stories, you know, and, uh, That's how, true. and stories can either be built into the game or stories can be, um, built purely by communities who play the game. Right. Right. So if you look at something like PUBG, mm-hmm. you know, it seems like, oh, it's a, it's a, sh- it's a sh- shooter. Yeah. There's so many thousands of shooters, right. But what actually happens with a game like that, which has voice chat is that you drop in. And there's an option that allows you to select what language people, like what what oral uh, language do you want to communicate in, uh-huh. right? Not the screen. The English, the game is English. I mean, at least most people go with the English interface. But when you're matchmaking, mm-hmm. you choose your language that yeah, you want to matchmake with, yeah. primary and secondary, right? So it could be English and Hindi or Marathi and Gujarati or, you know, Marathi and Hindi or Tamil and then English, things like that. Yeah. And so the moment you enter that, the moment you enter that experience of the four, four man or four, four person match, it becomes a community experience instantly. And there's a story now. Yeah. Right? Because now you've landed in an area 
and you and these three or four people who you potentially you know share a language with which is which is great yeah it's online. awesome it's yeah. awesome right because yeah. otherwise everything online is english right yeah. or or hindi it's sort of generic now it could be your could be your dialect yeah right and you're like oh i like instantly like i like you a little more because you sound like me yeah right and now we're going to we're going to create a narrative it's 20 minutes where we create a narrative and then we add as friends and we stay back and we play further and play longer and that's it so there's a story right there there's a story if you may, whether it's a large pc game whether it's an mmo rpg whether it's a shoot 'em up whether it's even ludo because mm-hmm. a lot of people play ludo sort of you know four people sitting around a, a, a table train. on yeah, a train, a train yeah. and they're talking shop they're talking about their day they you know just, just they, they're talking politics they're talking cricket they're talking all of that talking bollywood but they're playing Okay, so again, yeah. there's a there's a story that wow. all of that has to tie people up. Wow, that's that's super insightful, man. Thank. I mean, I think the passion is really showing through yeah. in in this conversation. So I'm really glad uh, you could share this. Uh, do you want to do like a quick shout out to folks who are listening in? Of course, who heard the story. Uh, talk about uh, opportunities. What you recommend? Uh, shout out how people can reach you, uh, or anything else. Sure. Look if. You know, like I said in the start, I'm kind of here more in a personal capacity and that's, that's, sure. the, that's the idea behind it. But if you're building games in India, right, keep at it. Just spend some time splicing the market. It doesn't have to be for an Indian audience. It can be international. Some massive world out there, you have access to it. Read up as much as you can, but try not, don't get FOMO, right? <laughs> don't be a bandwagon guy. Uh, don't jump into a genre or an area that you don't understand and build for it. Because games are a lot more complex than they seem, especially today. Meta games, uh, which are basically there's a core game and there's a story around the game or something that you have to do, action yeah. set of actions that you do around the, the basic game uh, are, are big today. Uh, but there's a lot more in terms of game mechanics that keeps people uh, attracted. So when you see a genre of game, don't just say I want to make that. You have to spend some time and understand why it's successful and don't go for the easy answer. Don't say that, hey, this game is successful because it has a famous actor. This game is successful because it it's action or it has blood or doesn't have blood or it, it targets kids or it's a card game. Don't say that because that is the easy answer. If it was that easy, then, well, this would be, the market would be washed out by two or three players, which it isn't, right? Or everybody would be in it, which, which, which is also not true. So break it down. Break down any genre that you want to work in, any title that you admire. And what people think the game is often isn't or often isn't the core mechanic right just like when you watch a movie it's not just the story or the actor and it's a direction it's a cinematography it's the it's the way the camera moves faster cutting between two people that can change the difference between how the discuss the discussion seems angry or peaceful or whether you feel involved or not involved what happens with gaming is that a lot of companies create look at the top 10 games and the rip off all of them Right, And then I've had these conversations saying that, oh, you know, I've been doing this for five years and I'm not successful, so the industry doesn't work. Right? <laughs> the amount of people that come to me and say, I have made a train simulator. There are 500 train simulators. Why is mine not working? <laughs> right? I'm making a Ludo game. Ludo is very hot. Why is mine not working? Right? I can't help you there. I mean, even I spend a lot of time in my personal capacity consulting with gaming companies. I think talk to easily. I talk to easily over 100 I've spoken easily over 100 the last six months, right? Like wow. it's an insane cadence that I have. I don't know. I'm just, this is, this is driven by, driven by passion and saying, I don't think I can do it forever, but and this is from outside, not necessarily work related, not within my work hours. I do it outside often. Um, but of course I meet a lot of gaming companies through work. And I, so one is that if I, if I'm not responding to you on LinkedIn, Right, it's only because I'm talking to somebody else, okay. right? And I'm trying not to get my wife very mad at me, so I try to go home and spend some time with my family. But there's a lot of great stuff online. One is look up the Indie Games Accelerator because it's really cool. Look up some of the other resources they're putting out very soon. There's a lot of great articles on how to make uh, games that that aren't you know that aren't breaking the rules that are giving users good experiences. And uh, stay posted, man. I'm going to be putting up a lot of stuff over the next couple of months. Awesome. So stay posted. Awesome. So we'll find you on LinkedIn. Do you want to do a Twitter or anything else where people can find uh, you? I don't know, man. You tell uh, me. I'm new to this. Well, I guess if you look me up on LinkedIn, I'll be there. But I'm 
terrible at responding. I think I was on 600 pending invitations at this point of time. I think that's the same for me. I think more than 1,000 for me. Oh, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, this man. was awesome. Uh, and for everyone listening in, of course, since Amit's not here with us today, let me also remind you that uh, you should go and give us ratings and reviews wherever you're listening to, whether it's Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting app or the IBM Podcast app. And of course, if you want to join in on the conversation jump in and speak to us on our Slack channel. Uh, go to ivmpodcast.com slash shunya1. You'll find a link to get invited. Just drop in your email address and we'll send you an invite and speak to you there. We are counting down almost on to the 100th episode. So stay Ooh. tuned for that. And uh, we will talk to you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I have a question. I'm going to drop a question at the end of the podcast. Oh, if you made it to the end of the podcast. Do you think it would be cool to have a gaming podcast? You know, leave the uh-huh. question out there let I these think, guys know I think we're going to do a poll question on our Slack channel also and anywhere else so we'll do this All right. we'll find out thank you Sharon thank you man thank you hi I'm Vishal Gondal an entrepreneur I've had the chance to meet and understand how some of the super achievers have hacked their way to success and they have done spectacular innovations Now I take a closer look at these people's lives to find out what lies beneath the force only on the Vishal Gondal show. Episodes out fortnightly on Wednesdays on the IVM website, app or your favorite podcasting platform. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Paisa Paisa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Pesa Vesa is brought to you by Paytm Money.